Hello, welcome back to our channel as Sisters in Zion. Um, our names are Antonia, Courtney, and Renee, and we are excited to share insights with all of you, and we welcome you to comment below um, with what you learned this week. Feel free to share this video with others as well. We have some online communities that we invite you to join. Links are in the description box. One is on Discord and the other is on Facebook, both with the name Zion or Bust. And without further ado, let's get into the scriptures. Hey, well, I guess I start out the block today. Um, my first insight for our study for uh, this week, I um, selected uh, John 316, 3, And the scripture reads, um, that which is born of the flesh is flesh, and that which is born of the spirit is spirit. Marvel not that I say unto thee, ye must be born again, the wind bloweth where it listeth, and thou hearest the sound thereof, but canst not tell whence it cometh, and whither it goeth. So is every one who is born of the Spirit. Nicodemus answered and said unto him, How can these things be? Jesus answered and said, Art thou a master of Israel, and knowest not these things? Verily, verily, I say unto thee, We speak that we do know, and testify that we have seen, and ye receive not our witness. This, for this section in the student manual, it says uh, Nicodemus could not at first understand the Savior's teaching that individuals must be born again in order to receive eternal life. As recorded in John 3, 6, the Savior taught him that spiritual things must be learned through the Spirit. President Miriam G. Romney of the First Presidency explained that Nicodemus had not yet been born of the Spirit, so he lacked the perception that comes from the Spirit. He simply could not understand that Jesus was saying there are two sources of knowledge, two different processes of learning, one through the normal senses of the flesh and the other through the voice of the spirit. The, sa the Savior further described the process of learning spiritual things by comparing the process to the blowing of the wind. Of this teaching, President Romney said, the master here, the master was here affirming that the knowledge to be obtained through the gift of the Holy Ghost, the rebirth of which the Lord had spoken, is just as sure and certain to us as the wind that blows, even though we cannot see it. The Lord was teaching Nicodemus that the process of learning about things from the Spirit is real, even though the Spirit's workings cannot be understood by those who have not been born again. After the Savior explained these truths about being born of, of water and the Spirit, Nicodemus still wondered at them, how can these things be? Jesus responded, Art thou a master of Israel and knowest not these things? The truths the Savior was teaching were taught in the Old Testament scriptures, and Nicodemus should have been familiar with them. In a talk by J. Clark entitled The Lord of Life in, in 1993, he notes that the intellectual Nicodemus was impressed with the miracles of Jesus but even with extensive knowledge of the scriptures, he could not grasp the doctrine of spiritual rebirth, the transformation of the human soul, what it means to be born again. He also commented about how nature provides us with some striking parallels. The late film producer Cecil B. DeMille shared this experience. He say, says, one day as I was lying in a canoe, a black beetle climbed up into the canoe or climbed up to the canoe. I watched it idly for some time. Under the heat of the sun, the beetle proceeded to die. Then a strange thing happened. His glistening black shell cracked all the way down to the back. Out of it came a shapeless mass, quickly transformed into beautifully brilliant colored life. There gradually unfolded, ir unfolded iridescent wings from which the sunlight flashed a thousand colors. The blue-green body took shape. Before my eyes had occurred a metamorphosis, the transformation of a hideous beetle into a gorgeous dragonfly, I had witnessed a miracle. Out of the mud had come a beautiful new life, and the thought came to me that if the Creator works such wonders with the lowliest of creatures, what may not be in store for the human spirit? He talks about, and he gives his testimony that through Jesus Christ, we can be born again. We can change. We can change completely, and we can stay changed. 
Such complete changes require the power of God. And he gives this promise to his covenant people. In Ezekiel uh, 36, we find that it says, A new heart also will I give you, a new spirit will I put within you, and cause you to walk in my statute. And then the king of the Lamanites in, uh, in the Lamanites in Alma, it says, what shall I do that I may have this eternal life, which thou hast spoken, that I may be born of God, having this wicked spirit rooted out of my breast and receive his spirit. I will give up all that I possess that I may receive this great joy. And then Aaron, who was uh, teaching him, uh, said to him, if thou desire this thing, if thou will bow down before God, yea, even if if thou will repent of all thy sins and call on his name in faith, believing that ye shall receive, then thou shalt receive the hope which thou desirest. And then he prostrated himself before the Lord. The king pled, if thou art God, wilt thou make thyself known unto me, and I'll give away all my sins to know thee. And this is all in Alma chapter 22. So my commentary here is, let's stay changed. Be the dragonfly we were formed to be and stop going back to the hideous beetle state so that we may be able to do as President Nelson has told us in his talk, hear him. We also hear him more clearly as we refine our ability to recognize the whisperings of the Holy Ghost. It has never been more imperative to know how the Spirit speaks to you than right now. In the Godhead, the Holy Ghost is the messenger. He will bring thoughts to your mind, which the Father and Son want you to receive. He is the comforter. He will bring a feeling of peace to your heart. He testifies to the truth and will confirm what is true as you hear and you read the word of the Lord. He renewed his plea for us to do whatever it takes to increase your spiritual capacity to receive personal revelation. I'm grateful that we have that ability to be able to be born at this time, to have all of this knowledge available to us. And we are uh, not only have been chosen, but we've also chosen and I'm grateful for that. And um, I'm grateful that um, that we do have uh, the spirit to um, enlighten us, um, unlike uh, Nicodemus did not have that, um, maybe because he didn't uh, choose to be chosen or because he, he clearly had the knowledge, but um, he didn't have... Um, uh, the ability to understand at that point where he was at. Mm -hmm. oh, that was my, um, any commentary? Yeah, while you're reading, I looked up, um, there's this quote by President Boyd K. Packer. Um, the, anyway, I love the way he words this. He says, if you learn by reason only, you will never understand the spirit and how it works, regardless of how much you learn about other things. The scriptures teach that great men are not always wise. Spiritually, you may know not and know not that you know not and be ever learning and never able to come to a knowledge of the truth. Your spirit learns in a different way than does your intellect. I think that's, I mean, exactly what you're saying, that Nicodemus was learned, right? He was very intelligent. He was very educated. Um, but there were things of the spirit that he had not learned yet. And that's a different process. Absolutely. It also reminds me of that section in Doctrine and Covenants where it talks about, um, you know, the way to go about learning. And, you know, the part that I think it's focused on a lot is um, and seek ye out the best books of learning, right? But the first half of that section is learn by faith. Mm -hmm. But as not all have faith, you know, seek it out in these good books. And I think that's a great point that really what we need to have happen is it's not our natural man. It's not that part that needs to be convinced. It's our spirit. That's what's brought back to remembrance. That's our testimony. Um, yeah, I like I like those thoughts a lot. Yeah, I like the visual, but the, I know because a lot of times it's hard for us to grasp, you know, the natural man. And we just kind of, I really enjoyed the visual of the hideous beetle and <laughs> the beautiful dragonfly, you know. <laughs> One day I will be a beautiful dragonfly. <laughs> <laughs> 
right now. I feel right like now. A lump of mass that's metamorphosing. <laughs> All right. So, sorry, I was going to say that kind of goes along with um, mine. So my first insight is John 2, 6. Um, and there were six water pots of stone after the manner of purifying of the Jews, containing two or three firkins a piece. Jesus saith unto them, fill the, and I put like in parentheses, so that's mine, purifying water pots with water. And they filled them up to the brim. And he saith unto them, draw out now and bear unto the governor of the feast. And they bear it. When the ruler of the feast had tasted the water that was made wine and knew not whence it was, but the servants which drew the water knew the governor of the feast called the bridegroom and saith unto him, every man at the beginning does set forth good wine. And when men have well drunk, then that which is worse, but thou hast kept the good wine until now. Mm -hmm. This beginning of miracles did Jesus in Cana of Galilee and manifested forth his glory and his disciples believed on him. So what I really like about this first miracle is that it talks a lot about what was, um, you know, in those, in those containers and they were used as part of purifying. And so it made me think a lot about why was wine the first miracle. So we talk about the remembrance of wine um, as we take the sacrament. So in Doctrine and Covenants 2079, so this is the sacrament prayer. It says, oh God, the eternal father, we ask thee in the name of thy son, Jesus Christ, to bless and sanctify this wine to the souls of all of those who drink it, that they may do it in remembrance of the blood of thy son, which was shed for them, that they may witness unto thee, O God, the eternal father, that they do always remember him, that they may have his spirit to be with them. And so as I was studying um, this miracle, and as I've, you know, kind of read through things, I'm always so impressed that it says one of his first miracles was turning the water into wine. Well, what kind of water? It was water that had been placed in these purifying, like ceremonial cleansings under the law of Moses. And he filled it to the brim. So it was purifying water to the brim that was then turned into wine. And I, so I threw out there, I kind of highlighted, you know, different sections in yellow. And then I also highlighted some in a light pink. So the um, governor of the feast, right? He said, oh my gosh, this is the best wine ever. Everyone always gives the good stuff at the beginning and the bad at the end. And he knew not. So there's a lot of times in the scriptures where we hear that phrase, like they, thou knowest not, or they knew not, or, you know, something along those lines. And so what came to my mind was Deuteronomy eight, and this is the JST. And he humbled thee and suffered thee to hunger and fed thee with manna, which thou knewest not. Neither did thy fathers know that he might make thee know that man doth not live by bread only, but by every word that proceedeth out of the mouth of the Lord doth man live. Um, and I, I think that kind of goes back to a lot of that wording about the woman by the well um, as she met Christ there. So I always think about out of all of the things that could have been done, why was it the water? that was put into these things that were used for ceremonial cleansing and such a law of Moses. Why was that what was turned into wine? Um, and then it always makes me think about um, the sacrament and how important the significance of the wine is to us there because we're doing that in remembrance of his blood that was shown. Um, so those were kind of my thoughts coming out of the miracle of Cana. I love the association of the, the wine with the sacrament. 
and how Jesus transformed the water into the wine. And then the sacrament says, bless and sanctify this wine. Like the process of taking the sacrament and all that, that entails transforms us. Mm -hmm. right? Christ is transforming us. I like, yeah, that's a beautiful connection. Yeah. Thank Make, you. Making the metamorphosis complete. Yeah. We're almost full drag and fly, and we're only like 20 minutes in, ladies. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> All right, Renee, you're up. Okay. Um, so for my first one, I noticed um, as I was reading through John chapter 2 that twice he mentions that Jesus' disciples remembered. Um, speaking of prophecies from scripture and they made connections between those scriptures and the events that they were witnessing live with Jesus. So the first example is John 2, 14 through 17. And Jesus found in the temple, those that sold oxen and sheep and doves and the changers of money sitting. And when he had made a scourge of small cords, he drove them all out of the temple and the sheep and the oxen and poured out the changers money and overthrew the tables. And said unto them that sold doves, take these things hence, make not my father's house an house of merchandise. And his disciples remembered that it was written, the zeal of thine house hath eaten me up. That's in Psalm 69, 9. Then after Jesus cleanses the temple, the Jews ask him, what sign shewest thou us, seeing that thou doest these things? And Jesus answered and said unto them, destroy this temple, and in three days I will raise it up. <clears throat> and, you know, the, the Jews, or, you know, who he was talking to were puzzled by this. Um, but going down to verse 22 says, when therefore Jesus was risen from the dead, his disciples remembered that he had said this unto them. And they believed the scripture and the word which Jesus had said. So they remembered and believed. <clears throat> I want to compare this to a quote from Elder Eyring about the disciples on the road to Emmaus after Jesus was resurrected. And um, he's, Elder Eyring says, In many ways we are like the two disciples who walked the road to Emmaus on the first Easter Sunday. It was resurrection morning but they were not yet sure there was a resurrection or what resurrection even meant. They had trusted that Jesus of Nazareth should have redeemed Israel, but they were slow of heart to believe everything the scriptures taught about resurrection. As they walked along and tried to reason it out together, Jesus himself drew near and went with them, but their eyes were holden that they should not know him. Jesus' disciples, <clears throat> had knowledge of and belief in the scriptures to the extent that they were able to recognize Jesus Christ for who he really was, the Son of God and their long-awaited Messiah. In contrast, the disciples on the road to Emmaus were slow of heart to believe everything the scriptures taught, and so their eyes were holden, that they should not know him. Um, I wanted to point out that Matthew is another great example of recognizing fulfillments of prophecy. He points out many of those in his writings. Uh, this is from the student manual. It says, Matthew appears to have written to a Jewish audience, to both Jews who may have accepted Jesus as the Messiah and those who did not, to show that Jesus Christ was the fulfillment of Old Testament messianic prophecy. Matthew frequently referred to Old Testament prophecies and used the phrase that it might be fulfilled. Uh, one of the, uh, one example of this is in Matthew 1. He says, now all this was done that it might be fulfilled, which was spoken of the Lord by the prophet, saying, behold, a virgin shall be with the child and shall bring forth a son, and they shall call his name Emmanuel, which being interpreted is God with us. You can see Isaiah 714 for that reference. Um, just one other example is the triumphal entry. And Matthew says, all this was done that it might be fulfilled. 
uh, which was spoken by the prophet, saying, Tell ye the daughter of Zion, behold, thy king cometh unto thee, meek and sitting upon an ass, and a colt, the full of an ass. And you can see Isaiah and Zechariah for those references. So all of this goes to show that Jesus' disciples knew the scriptures to the extent that as they witnessed Jesus' birth, his ministry, his death, his resurrection, they were able to recognize these events as the little, literal fulfillment of prophecy. The strength in their faith that Jesus Christ is in reality the Son of God, the Messiah, and that he had come to dwell among men in the flesh. We are also commanded to know the scriptures and the signs and prophecies of the times, so that when we see these events take pl place, we will also recognize them for what they truly are, fulfillment of prophecy. Um, and we can't do that if we don't know the scriptures and the prophecies that are contained in them. <laughs> Excuse me. In 2020, President Nelson said, I encourage you to make a list of all that the Lord has promised he will do for covenant Israel. I think you will be astounded. Ponder these promises. Talk about them with your family and friends. Then live and watch for these promises to be fulfilled in your own life. As you choose to let God prevail in your lives, you will experience for yourself that God, our God, is a God of miracles. As a people, we are his covenant children, and we will be called by his name. Do we know what the promises and prophecies to covenant Israel are? Do we understand the prophecies of Isaiah, the Book of Mormon, and of Jesus Christ himself? I wrote down a couple of examples here. In 3 Nephi 20, And it came to pass that when the people of Nephi had given all glory unto Jesus, he said unto them, Behold, now I finish the commandment which the Father hath commanded me concerning this people who are a remnant of the house of Israel. Ye remember that I spake unto you, and said that when the words of Isaiah should be fulfilled, Behold, they are written, you have them before that you, therefore search them. And verily, verily, I say unto you, that when they shall be fulfilled, then is the fulfilling of the covenant which the Father hath made unto this people, O house of Israel. And then shall the remnants, which shall be scattered abroad upon the face of the earth, be gathered in from the east and from the west and from the south and from the north. And they shall be brought to a knowledge of the Lord their God, who hath redeemed them. And behold, this people will I establish in the land unto the fulfilling of the covenant which I made with your father Jacob, and it shall be a new Jerusalem. And the powers of heaven shall be in the midst of this people, yea, even I will be in the midst of you. President Nelson again in 2020 said, We live in the day that our forefathers have awaited with anxious expectation. We have front row seats to witness live what the prophet Nephi saw only in vision, that the power of the Lamb of God would descend upon the covenant people of the Lord, who were scattered upon all the face of the earth, and they were armed with righteousness and with the power of God in great glory. You, my brothers and sisters, are among those men, women, and children whom Nephi saw. Think of that. Will we be able to recognize this and other events when we see them come to pass? I want to go back to President Eyring's talk and uh, liken it to our day. In many ways, we may be like the two disciples who walked the road to Emmaus on that first Easter Sunday. It was time to redeem Zion, but they were not yet sure there was a literal Zion or what Zion really meant. They had trusted that Jesus should come again, but they were slow of heart to read and believe everything the scriptures taught about events leading up to the great and dreadful day of the Lord. As they walked along and tried to reason it out together, Jesus himself drew near and dwelt with his people in New Jerusalem, but their eyes were holden that they should not know him. It is so important for each of us to make time to really study and understand the scriptures. It is not enough to read or listen to other people's commentary on the scriptures, including mine and ours. <laughs> Each of us individually must put in the effort, reading the words directly as given by Jesus Christ and his prophets. 
One of the many blessings of doing so is that when we see the prophesied events transpire in our day, we can, like the faithful disciples of Jesus' time, remember that he had said this unto us and believe the scripture and the word which Jesus has said. Our faith will be strengthened and we will be able to see and truly know him when he comes again. Amen. I have two commentaries on that. One, uh, absolutely, you know, the Jews, they knew the scriptures, you know, Peter, and they were fishermen and they were common people. And uh, Matthew was, uh, you know, uh, a tax collector. And, um, you know, all the people that Jesus, you know, surrounded, even the Samaritan woman, you know, all these people he encountered, they knew the scriptures. They, and you go on the streets today, anywhere, people don't know the scriptures. They don't, they don't have no idea, you know, you ask them. The, probably the only one they know is, you know, John 3.16, because it's, you know, on the football games all the time, it's being advertised, but no one knows the scriptures. They don't know the prophets. They don't know or the books of the, they don't know. It's very, very unfortunate, mm -hmm. you know, but I guess there is a telestial sphere of it. There'll be plenty there. Cool. Well, and even in Joseph Smith's day, it was very common for yes. for everyone to know the Bible. Yes. And be familiar with with the Bible. Yeah, I, I guess we're just too too much into Babylon with all of the yeah. distractions, you know. Mm -hmm. Just just, just... Oh, sorry, go ahead and Courtney. Oh, that's okay. I was going to say, and their love shall wax cold and they shall become lovers of their selves, right? Like, I would say that most of the people don't know the scriptures because they don't know they have a heavenly father. They don't know they have a savior, right? You're probably going to find a lot more people who um, are like proud to not know anything about the scriptures because they don't believe in in that yeah there is that for sure um one of the things that concerns me the most talking of members of the church and also other christians is i observe that a lot of people like to listen to other people's commentary so i kind of mentioned that at the end here mm -hmm. that, that we like to listen to what other people have to say about the scriptures you know, and that's what we're doing right now. So I'm not saying that's a bad thing, but it cannot replace you're actually good. reading the scriptures, right? So if, if you're listening to this, <laughs> if you out there are listening to As Sisters in Zion right now and you haven't read John 2 through 4, I would suggest you pause us and read John 2 through 4 first mm -hmm. and then this can be a supplement and and i think it's wonderful to share what we've learned and share our insights and everything but but you've got to go directly and, and read it directly yeah and like we said earlier you know you, you when you read and you study um you know these are the insights that we highlight from the many of the ones that you know that we we um receive as we're reading them but they're individual because the spirit, as we learned earlier, that um, that's what teaches us these things um, and how apply them to um, our lives. And they're like um, signposts in the journey that we have. And if you're not doing it, you're not going to hear it, see it, and, you know, no. The other commentary I wanted to make is that it, it really stood out to me here um, in uh, Third Nephi 20. And then the remnants, not the remnant, but the remnants. It's not just one remnant. And mm -hmm. it's abroad the face of the earth. And mm -hmm. I really uh, love uh, to hear that. I loved hearing that because it made me Think of um, all our brothers and sisters that are not here where the New Jerusalem will be built, which we know is going to be in, in Missouri. We know that by studying the scriptures and knowing um, what we've been taught, um, 
by the modern prophets, right? And, uh, but sometimes my heart uh, wonders, you know, what about our Australian or New Zealand or Samoans or Hawaiians or all of them, you know, I, or Alaskans, you know, I, I think of them and I think, well, how I can get here, you know? I, I know the father has, you know, a, a plan for that, but I, I think of that. That's that's what made me think about. It. So it 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 did um, it gave me joy knowing that. Yeah, I think that the other thing that that people, you know, really really need to recognize is that no one can replace what the Holy Ghost can teach you. So. Mm -hmm. A lot of, you know, one of the reasons that it was so important to me to talk about, um, you know, what, what that wine meant for the first miracle, it was, that's what was impressed upon me to talk about. And you have to be able to be receptive and understand and have that spirit with you always. And, you know, you're just not able to replicate that. Even us doing this, we can't replicate what the Holy Ghost can teach you and strengthen you. Um, this is just, um, you know, some other thoughts to think about. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Good. Good stuff. Okay. We're ready to move on. Yeah. Okay. Um, my second thought went to uh, John 4, uh, verses 31 through 38. Um, and the scriptures read, In the meanwhile, his disciples prayed for him, saying, Master, eat. But he said unto them, I have meat to eat that ye know not of. Therefore said the disciples to one, one to another, Hath any man brought him ought to eat? Jesus said unto them, my meat is to do the will of him that sent me and to finish his work. Say not ye, therefore, there are yet four months and then cometh harvest. Behold, I say unto you, lift up your eyes and look on the fields, for they are white already to harvest. And he that reapeth receiveth wages and gathereth fruit unto life eternal, that both he that soweth and he that reapeth may rejoice together. And herein is that saying true, one soweth and another reapeth. I sent you to reap that whereon ye bestowed no labor, and other men labored, and ye are entered into their labors. Um, I want to focus on uh, this particular part where he's talking about the meat to do the will of him that sent me. In 2009, uh, D. Todd Christofferson, in a talk entitled Moral Discipline, uh, referred to uh, President Faust in that he recognized that we all possess the God-given gift of moral agency, the right to make choices, and the obligation to account for those choices. He also understood and demonstrated that for positive outcomes, moral agency must be accompanied by moral discipline. By moral discipline, he means, I mean self-discipline, self-discipline based on moral standards. Moral discipline is the consistent exercise of agency to choose the right because it is right, even when it is hard. It rejects the self-absorbed life in favor of developing character worthy of respect and true greatness through Christ-like service. The root word of discipline is shared by the word disciple, suggesting to the mind the fact that conformity to the example and teachings of Jesus Christ is the ideal discipline that, coupled with his grace, forms a virtuous and morally excellent person. Jesus' own moral discipline was rooted in his discipleship to the Father. To his disciples, he explained, my meat is to do the will of him that sent me and to finish his work. By this same pattern, our moral discipline is rooted in loyalty and devotion to the Father and to the Son. It is the gospel of Jesus Christ that provides the moral certainty upon which moral re discipline rests. The societies in which many of us live have more than a generation failed to foster moral discipline. They have taught that the truth is relative and that everyone decides for himself or herself what is right. 
Concepts such as sin and wrong have been condemned as value judgments, as the Lord describes it. Every man walketh in his own way after the image of his own God. As a consequence, self-discipline has eroded and societies are left to try to maintain order and civility by compulsion. The lack of internal control by individuals breeds external control by governments. Our increased reliance on laws to regulate behavior is a measure of how uncivilized we've become. And my, isn't that a conviction of what we're living now? Uh, Joseph B. Horthlin, in his talk in 1997, uh, true, to, true to Truth, stated, when we are living righteously, we, re righteously, we rejoice that we can report positively our worthiness and our preparation for continued blessings. Mortal experience gives us the opportunity to assess what we are doing with our lives. I'll help. They all help us school our souls and strengthen our characters in preparation for that final interview. And if we are prepared, we shall not fear. In 1966, Ezra Taft Benson entitled the talk uh, in his steps stated that spiritual strength promotes positive thinking, positive ideals, positive habits, positive attitudes, and positive efforts. These are the qualities that pr promote wisdom, physical and mental well-being, and enthusiastic acceptance and response by others. Or favor with God gives necessary incentive and perspective to life. It gives man real purpose for live, living and achieving. As always, we have the example of the master to guide us. My meat, he said, is to do the will of him that sent me. And again, Father, I have glorified thee on the, on the earth, and I have finished the work which thou hast, thou gavest me to do. He was faithful in duty. We increase in favor with God as we do the will of God. Let us be faithful in the work he gives us, whatever it may be and whatever our station in life. Let our desires be in harmony with God's will as it is revealed to us, keeping his word in our hearts, conquering selfish desires that would lead us astray. And then um, Elder Sterling W. Sill in 1961, in a talk entitled Lift Up Your Eyes, said Jesus once explained one source of his strength when he said, my need is to do the will of him that sent me and finish his work. Doing God's will is also our greatest possible source of strength. To encourage his disciples to follow him in doing the Father's will, Jesus spoke some lines that I would like to use as text. He said, lift up your eyes and look on the fields, for they are white already to harvest. Certainly our day is most urgent, is a most urgent time to re-echo that theme. We should lift up our eyes to see our duty and to understand our opportunities, to accept our responsibilities, and to put truth in force in our lives. We should lift up our eyes to worship God and serve our fellow men as the Lord has commanded. And um, there's not much more I can add to this, but that uh, just saying that um, we have a wonderful example and, and the scriptures are replete of, of uh, many examples and not just examples of what to do, but also examples of what not to do. And we're, we're blessed to have these, um, I guess, um, tried and true um, men and women of God. And uh, how can we not um, see and do? Was that the end? That was it. Uh -huh. Okay. I wasn't sure because it was just, it was powerful at the end there. <laughs> um, I do really, I really like the, um, this quote where it talks about doing God's will is also our greatest possible source of strength. And in the readings this week, um, when Mary asked Jesus or didn't ask him, but she told him, you know, they've run out of wine. Um, you know, he mentioned that it wasn't his time yet. So even though 
there was a need presented and she had asked him, he was always still fulfilling his father's will. And it wasn't time for him to yet, um, you know, reveal himself in that venue. Um, and I think this also reminds me a lot about obedience. So we hear a lot about, oh, it's blind obedience, or you're just, you know, you're just following President Nelson blindly. And it's, well, I would rather follow God's will and have that become my strength than try to figure out on my own what I'm supposed to be doing with my life. Because I know nothing that I can create, no direction that I can go is going to be equal to the plan Heavenly Father has for me. Mm hmm I think it's interesting that throughout all three of these chapters, there's multiple references to meat and water, and you know, as in a spiritual sense, that, you know, eating meat sustains your body, and then likening that to working, doing the Father's will, right? Mm-hmm doing the gospel sustains us spiritually like and if right it keeps keeps our souls alive <laughs> yes <laughs> it helps for those times when we have no more physical strength that we can rely on our testimony <laughs> still burning bright <laughs> yeah all right. Brittany, you're up. Okay. So I am continuing here with my uh, yellow and purple highlights. So in John 3 14, it says, And as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, even so must the Son of Man be lifted up, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have eternal life. Um, and so my additions to that, that whosoever believeth in him, or knowest of him, uh, going back to that earlier thought, should not perish, but have eternal life. And if we remember in John 2, 9, it said, when the ruler of the feast had tasted the water that was made wine and knew not whence it was, but the servants knew which drew the water knew, the governor of the feast called the bridegroom. Well, who is the bridegroom? It's Christ. So that miracle of itself, was dealing with Christ and the water turned into wine. That was symbolic of that atonement. Um, in Alma 33, 19, it says, behold, he was spoken of by Moses. Yea, And a type was raised up in the wilderness that whosoever would look upon it might live. And many did look and live, but few understood the meaning of those things. And this because of the hardness of their hearts, but there were many who were so hardened that they would not look, therefore they perished. Now the reason they, that they would not look is because they did not believe that it would heal them. Oh, my brethren, if ye could be healed by merely casting about your eyes that ye might be healed, would ye not behold quickly or would ye rather harden your hearts in unbelief and be slothful that ye would not cast about your eyes that ye might perish. If so, woe shall come upon you. But if not so, then cast about your eyes and begin to believe in the Son of God, that he will come to redeem his people, and that he shall suffer and die to atone for their sins, and that he shall rise again from the dead, which shall bring to pass the resurrection, that all men shall stand before him, to be judged at the last judgment day, according to their works. In this section, I liked how they talked about Moses and the serpent. And they talked about how that was a type, a type and a shadow for Christ. Um, and there were, you know, many, who, and Alma said, there are many who looked and lived. They didn't understand the meaning, but they looked and lived. And then there was the second group, right? Those that were hardened. They would not look 
and therefore they perished. And I wonder how many, how many times, like we've seen this play out, you know, in our wards, um, in the church, that there are people who, even though they don't understand the meaning of all things are willing to go forward with faith. And they're willing to do just that small act to believe and to look. And there are others who harden their hearts and they won't look. And it talks about, um, you know, the hardening of your hearts and unbelief and being slothful and um, not casting your eyes that way. And I think a lot of this kind of comes down to our testimony of the restored gospel of Jesus Christ that we have in our church, that we know the church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints is the only true church, and that President Nelson is God's prophet at this time. Um, And I feel like that's such a primary answer. (laughs) You know, you're like, what are you going to do so you can look and live? And like all the little kids are like, follow the prophet, right? You know, or they're like, um, you know, we believe in Joseph Smith, but it's, I think it's interesting to me that he called out that their action was to look, even though they did not understand the meaning of it, they were still willing to take that action. Um, you know, and when president Nelson talked about the Lord loves effort, That's what came into my mind as I read this. These were people who put forth that effort on faith. They didn't understand it, but they still looked and lived. I like this, the, the, the words there that say not only that they got belief, but they were slothful. In other words, they were lazy. They were, they were too lazy to just even cast their eyes there because that's all they had to do it was a simple thing just look Mm -hmm. and like you said there were those that didn't understand but they still looked yeah i like the connection this phrase um and they knew not whence it was and then later on you highlighted few understood the meaning of these things yeah And how one of the things that makes it hard to do the primary answer things is that we're like, how is this going to help? (laughs) Like, I I don't understand how it works. Um, Like one of the things that I wish I could go back in time and tell past me as a teenager or a young child, you know, don't do this. I'm like, (laughs) just. The power, I mean, we've talked about this several times tonight, but the power of reading the scriptures on your own with the Holy Ghost, right? Mm-hmm. And I'm like, I don't fully understand the mechanism of how that works. But I know that when I study, not just necessarily reading, you know, reading to get my however many verses in for the night or, you know, my chapter in for the day or whatever, but like when I am reading prayerfully, when I'm reading to understand when I'm reading with a question. I've had some times where I have felt to pray to know what questions I should ask, right? Mm -hmm. Um, If if there hasn't been something that's been on my mind, right? So like when when I read that way, um, to learn and seeking for knowledge and seeking to understand things, the spirit really just blossoms. (laughs) And the spirit will take you from place to place and connect things. And it like that experience is not possible in any other way. And, and again, I'm like, I don't understand all of the mechanisms of how that works and how the Holy Spirit works and everything. But I know that if I do this thing, um, that I will have the spirit and I will gain knowledge. And so if you understood the meaning, right, but you don't have to understand, you, you just have to do, you have to do what the prophet tells you to do. Look at this look at the serpent, look at the serpent, (laughs) whatever it is, and be okay 
with not understanding everything. Yeah, I always think of, um, you know, that, that hymn where it says sacrifice brings forth the blessings of heaven. Mm -hmm. Sometimes if we can just sacrifice to act in faith, that's when we get those blessings. Mm -hmm. Love it. All right. You're up. My next one. So as I was reading John chapter three, um, it really jumped out at me, not Nicodemus personally, um, because I he does seem sincere, um, like he's sincerely seeking, but the Pharisees as a group, as compared with John the Baptist at the end of the chapter, um, and how different they are. So <clears throat> I'm just going to go through and read here. John 3, 1 says, there was a man of the Pharisees named Nicodemus, a ruler of the Jews. The Bible dictionary gives some information um, under Pharisees, it says a religious party among the Jews. The name denotes separatists. They prided themselves on their strict obedient observance of the law and on the care with which they avoided contact with things Gentile. Their belief included the doctrine of immortality and the resurrection of the body and the existence of angels and spirits. They upheld the authority of oral tradition as of equal value with the written law. The tendency of their teaching was to reduce religion to the observance of a multiplicity of ceremonial rules and to encourage self-sufficiency and spiritual pride. They were a major, a major obstacle to the reception of Christ and the gospel by the Jewish people. Then in Jesus the Christ, James E. Talmadge, right, um, gives some more information that I think is really interesting. So he says, scribes and, rabbis, scribes and rabbis were exalted to the highest rank in the estimation of the people, higher than that of the Levitical or priestly orders. And rabbinical sayings were given precedence over the utterances of the prophets, since the latter were regarded as the messengers or spokesmen, whereas the living scholars were of themselves sources of wisdom and authority. Pharisees are often coupled with the scribes. <clears throat> um, I'm going to skip that one and go down here. The authority of the priesthood was outwardly acknowledged by the Jews at the time of Christ, and the appointed order of, uh, and the appointed order of service for priest and Levite was duly observed. But in the regard of the people, the priests were inferior to the rabbis and the scholarly attainments of a scribe transcended the honor um, of that pertaining to ordination in the priesthood. <clears throat> so, one of the things that, that really struck me in there was that, you know, these Pharisees, are religious leaders at the time we talk about that, that Jesus addresses Nicodemus as they're talking. He says, you know, aren't you a ruler? And you, you know, you should know these things, right? So they were rulers of the people. Um, but they were not priesthood leaders, right? Because it says the authority of the priesthood existed in the Levites and the priests. But the, in the regard of the people, right, they regarded the scribes and the rabbis above what they regarded the priesthood, right? So then you compare this to John the Baptist, where Jesus Christ says of him, Verily I say unto you, among them that are born of women, there hath not risen a greater than John the Baptist. Joseph Smith in... The teachings of the prophet Joseph Smith says John at the time was the only legal administrator in the affairs of the kingdom. Uh, that there was of oh, the kingdom there was then on the earth and holding the keys of power. So John was a was a legal administrator 
or we would say he had priesthood authority, right? He held the keys of power of the priesthood. Doctrine and Covenants 121, 41 and 42 says, no power or influence can or ought to be maintained by virtue of the priesthood, only by persuasion, by long suffering, by gentleness and meekness, and by love unfeigned, by kindness and pure knowledge, which shall greatly enlarge the soul without hypocrisy and without guile. Then going down to John 3 from this week, John answered and said, a man can receive nothing except it be given him from heaven. Ye yourselves bear me witness that I said, I am not the Christ, but that I am sent before him. He that hath the bride is the bridegroom, but the friend of the bridegroom, which standeth and heareth him, rejoiceth greatly because of the bridegroom's voice. This my joy, therefore, is fulfilled. He must increase, but I must decrease. He that cometh from above is above all. He that is of the earth is earthly and speaketh of the earth. He that cometh from heaven is above all. And then this quote from President Thomas S. Monson. He says, John the Baptist provides for us a flawless example of unfeigned humility as he deferred always to the one who was to follow, the savior of mankind. So I just wanted to compare these two because, and, and I had two main thoughts. Um, so there, the first one is worldly power versus priesthood power. That you see you have all these groups that are very powerful, that have a large amount of influence in, you know, among the Jews at, at the time that Jesus was alive. And and they had that worldly power. They had political influence. They were wealthy. They were often upper class. You had the, the, the Pharisees and the Sadducees and the Sanhedrin, you know, all these things. And comparing that to the priesthood power, which was held by John the Baptist, and he wore camel's hair, <laughs> right? And, you know, was, was not, did not set him above other people, did not set himself above others that he, um, what did President Monson said? He had unfeigned humility. He deferred always to the savior. He pointed always to the savior and, and was that example of meekness and long suffering, right? And, and pure knowledge, right? That he preached pure doctrine. Um, so, so that was my first thought. And then the second thought was this idea of the religious political social leaders versus the priesthood leaders. And I've seen some things pop up here and there, different places about how people say, well, you know, the, the religious leaders of Jesus day obviously had gone astray. And so like our leadership is obviously fallible and these are fallible men. And I think it's important to realize that while the Pharisees were religious leaders, they did not have priesthood authority. They were not God's leaders that God had set in place, right? They were they were political, they were elected, they were wealthy, <laughs> right? Um, versus the priesthood leaders were John the Baptist, and then later on, Peter, right? Peter and the apostles who Jesus called and set apart to lead the church. And so I think it's important to, to keep that context that as we look for examples of the leadership of the church in Jesus's time, that's not the Pharisees. It's not the rabbis and the scribes. It's John the Baptist and Peter and the apostles is the, is the example of, of those things. I think it's interesting that in spite of <clears throat> there being a temple and having the the Levites, which are the, the priesthood holders, none of them held that power that John the Baptist had. And that <clears throat> the arrogance of these <clears throat> organizations, which were the Sanhedrin, the Pharisees, and the Sadducees, that they, you know, modeled this organization based on God's laws and that based on that they were above those laws and governed the people and um 
yeah, that's uh, that's quite a bit to to um, to swallow because you know. I mean, here we are. We know we know the organization of the church and how the Lord has organized the church, and mm-hmm. you know we we follow that that model and that example. We follow the prophet, and we um, these these men uh, had. Uh, I guess maybe that's why because they were they were so privileged. They felt that they, you know, that they were above everything. Yeah. And it, and it was that seeking after the worldly power. They wanted the political power and the influence and the honors of men. And I think, yeah. So they're also very tied to like their, their lineage. Right. So mm-hmm. they're, you know, well, I came down from this lineage and that's why I am in, you know, I can act in these ordinances. And I saw an interesting video recently and it was Elder Bednar and he was talking at Enzyme College. I think this was the one. I can't remember, but um, he talked about how when people get up and they bear their testimony and they say, well, my ancestors, you know, immigrated from England or from wherever, and they walked across the trails and, you know, and they talk on and on that he said, sometimes he thinks to himself, but what have you done? (laughs) You know, and I, I think there's a lot to understand about the sacrifices that have been made in our families but we also have to know for ourselves we still have to have that faith that it took them to cross you know planes to live at winter quarters with scurvy to continue to follow Brigham Young you know and I think sometimes that's that's where we, we as a church, I think, can focus a lot on the pioneers and, and those sacrifices. But we also have to be willing to make those sacrifices. And, and I think it's true that John the Baptist was a great example of that. You know, we don't have in the scriptures that he went up to Christ and said, oh, I'm so glad you're here. I've baptized 30,000 people. I've been waiting, right? No, he didn't. (laughs) He understood who he was, what he was meant to do. And he gave that glory to Christ. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I I heard President Uchtdorf speak once and he was talking about citizenship I think, I think it was like a 4th of July thing. Um, but yeah, but he was talking about, you know, I, I have multiple citizenships. I'm, I forget his original, his country of original origin before Germany. I think it was, I think he's, I think it was Czech, was it Czechoslovakia. Yeah. yeah so he's like, I'm, I, I could be wrong, but he's, he's, I think Czech, you know, and then German, cause they moved to Germany He said, and I'm also American, but most importantly of all, I am a citizen of the kingdom of God. Mm-hmm. I loved that because that's what we should all want. And that has nothing to do with your literal ancestry or your literal country of origin, right? Entry into the kingdom of God is based on ordinances being baptized and then your personal, your personal righteousness and striving and working things out with the savior. Yeah. Just made me think about citizen of the kingdom of God. Yeah. Yeah. It reminds me of the three things, the three titles that we should only be concerned about child of God, Mm -hmm. child of the covenant and disciple of Christ. Those are the only titles we should have care about. Mm -hmm. Mm Mm-hmm. Yeah, was it in this last general conference that um, we heard a talk about that where it said your most important identity? I think it was this last conference, wasn't it? Yeah, it sounds very familiar. 
Yeah, know for that. Yeah, those are the the, the three identities. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Speaking of which, we only have two months before next conference, and I'm already excited. <laughs> <laughs> Your countdown chain yeah. or whatever. <laughs> yeah. yeah, I love it. I love <laughs> it. We'll move on to our number threes. Um, so this last um, insight. I kind of pondered it for the whole week and then it came came together um yesterday I believe. And so this is um the the, the there's two things here that um that are, are gonna come from this this long uh, discussion on this or or insight. And there's just two two um two thoughts, provoking thoughts. Okay. They're not anything uh, really doctrinally speaking here, but things to to ponder uh, further or maybe even study further. Um, I'm not going to read the scripture um, because it's going to be in the in the in the discussion or the expounding of it and uh, the references in John two verses one through ten. And again, this is about the marriage. Um, Orson Hyde. Um, wrote a discourse, a very long discourse about this. And I'm going to read from some of it. And it's going to be very thought provoking. Um, but I really felt compelled that I needed to uh, share with it. In the end, I'll kind of put some of what I wanted to uh, highlight here. He talks about, and, the, and it's entitled The Marriage Relations. Um, he starts out by saying, let's see what Abraham's works were. Abraham obtained promises. What promise have you obtained? What promise has a Christian world obtained? Why says one, the Bible is full, is all full of promises made to the people of God long ago. But what have the promises to the people of God long ago to do with us? Have we obtained promises to ourselves? There's the point. If our fathers obtained promises that they should be fed and were fed, their eating and drinking does not satisfy my appetite. It satisfied them. But that has nothing to do with me. I want the same kind of substantial food myself. If Abraham obtained promises, I want to obtain the promises also. What? A man has to do more, has to... A man that has more than one wife obtained promises from God? I tell you, there were but few in olden times who ever did obtain promises from God that had not more than one wife, if the Bible be true. There was David and there was Solomon. There were the whole line of kings of Israel, says one. That old Bible was for the Jews and nothing to do with us. That is the Old Testament. Having more wives was according to their law and according to their custom, but it does not apply to us. The Savior of the world is our great pattern and he is our lawgiver all right then how is it with him let us inquire did the savior of the world consider it to be his duty to fulfill all righteousness in matthew 3 15 right it says you answer well yes even the simple ordinance of baptism he would not pass by for the lord commanded it and therefore it was righteousness to obey what the lord had commanded and he would fulfill all righteousness now, upon this hypothesis, he will go back to the beginning and notice that the commandment that was given to our first parents in the Garden of Eden, the Lord said to the, unto them, multiply and replenish the earth. So herein is one of the first points that I want to kind of just to thought provoke here. He says, the Lord commanded them multiply and replenish the earth. He, he's going to digress here and he says on this subject and bring an idea that may perhaps may have bearing on it. He says, the earth you remember was void and empty until our first parents began at the Garden of Eden. So what does the term replenish mean? The word is derived from the Latin re and plenus. Re denotes repetition, iteration, and plenus signifies full, complete. Then the meaning of the word replenish is to refill and recomplete. If I were to go into a merchant store and find that he got a new stock of goods, I would I should say, 
you have replenished your stock, that is, filled up your establishment, for it looks as it did before. Now go forth, says the Lord, and replenish the earth, for it was covered with gloomy clouds of darkness, excluded from the light of heaven, and darkness brooded on the face of the deep. The world was peopled before the days of Adam, as much so as it was before the days of Noah. It was said that Noah became the father of a new world, but it was the same old world still and will continue to be, though it may pass through many changes. When God said, go forth and replenish the earth, it was to replenish the inhabitants of the human species and make it as it was before. Our first parents then were commanded to multiply and replenish the earth. So there is the first thought provoking uh, thought there about replenishing the earth. Are we replenishing um, the earth? And the second thought is, so if the Savior found it his duty to be baptized to fulfill all righteousness, a command far less important importance than that of multiplying the race, if indeed there is any difference in the commandments of Jehovah, for they are all important and all essential, would he not find it his duty to join in with the rest of the faithful ones in replenishing the earth? Mr. Hyde, do you really wish to imply that the Immaculate Savior begat children? Is it a blasphemous assertion against the purity of the Savior's life to say the least of it? The holy aspirations that ever ascended from him to his father would never allow him to have any such fleshly and carnal connections. Never, no, never. This is a, the general idea. But the Savior never thought it beneath him to obey the mandate of his father. He never thought this stooping beneath his dignity. He never despised what God had made, for they are bone of his bone and flesh of his flesh, kindred spirits that once bask in rays of immortality and eternal life. When he found them clothed and upon and surrounded by the weaknesses of mortal flesh, would he despise them? No, it is this. I have seen men who become poor, became poor and miserable all at once. And then those who were with their friends in the days of their prosperity turned from them and scarcely deigned to be stock them a look, it being too humiliating to associate with them in their poverty. poverty. But it was not so with the Savior. He associated with them in other spheres, and when they came here descending below all things, he did not despise to associate with these same kindred spirits. Then you merely mean to hold the doc to the doctrine that the Savior of the world was married? Do you mean to be understood so? And if so, do you mean to be understood that he had more than one wife? I'll go further and say, he then directs us to look at the old prophecy of Isaiah. Starting in Isaiah, he says, it is there said in um, Isaiah 53, when thou shalt make his soul an offering for, the, for sin, he shall see his seed. In Isaiah 53, 10, what constitutes the soul? And indeed, see 88, 15, the spirit and the body of man united. For you know it is said that in one place that so many souls were slain in the night of in the night by the angel of God in 2 Kings. The immortal part was not slain, but a disunion of the mortal and the immortal parts took place. When they shall make his soul an offering for sin, he shall see his seed. In Mosiah 15, it says, if he has no seed, how could he see them? When they make his soul an offering for sin, he shall see his seed and prolong his days. And the pleasure of the Lord shall prosper in his hand. By and by, the prophet goes on to say, and who shall declare his generation? Isaiah 53, 8, for his life is taken from the earth. If he had no generation, who could declare it? I told you there was an agent who would bring out every subject in bold relief, which is the Holy Ghost, who searches all things, even the deep things of God. And until that celestial agent should fire some man's heart to declare this generation, it could never be made known. So who shall declare it? He could not, for he was cut off from the earth. I have noticed the prophecy of Isaiah, that portion of it which is, was fulfilled in the person of the Savior. For the Lord divided him a portion with the great, and he shall divide the spoil with the strong, because he hath poured out his soul unto death. He was taken from prison and, and from judgment. Who shall declare his generation? For he was cut off from the land of the living for the transgression of my people. He was stricken. 
Now, if one portion of this prophecy has been fulfilled, the other portion has or will be. So how was it with Mary and Martha and the other women that followed him? In old times, and it is common in this day, the women, even Sarah, called their husbands Lord. The word Lord is tantamount to the husband in some languages. Master, Lord, husband are about synonymous. In England, we frequently hear the wife say, where is my master? She does not mean a tyrant, but as Sarah called to her husband, Lord, she designates hers by the word master. When Mary of old came to the sepulcher on the first day of the week, instead of finding Jesus, she saw two angels in white, and they say unto her, Woman, why weepest thou? She said unto them, Because they have taken away my Lord or husband, and I know not where they have laid him. And when she had thus said, she turned herself back and saw Jesus standing, and knew not that it was Jesus. And Jesus said unto her, Woman, why weepest thou? Whom seekest thou? She, supposing him to be the gardener, said unto him, Sir, if thou have borne him hence, tell me where thou hast laid him, and I will take him away. Jesus saith unto her, Mary. She turned herself and saith unto him, Rabboni, which is to say, Master, is there not here manifested the affections of a wife? These words speak the kindred ties and sympathies that are common to that relation of husband and wife. Where will you find a family so nearly allied by the ties of common religion? Well, you say that appears rather plausible, but I want a little more evidence. I want you to find where it says the Savior was actually married. So here we come to this section of that uh, uh, scripture. Um, we will turn over to the account of the marriage of uh, Cana and Galilee, and the mother of Jesus was there, yes, and somebody else too. You will find it in the second chapter of John's Gospel. Remember it and read it when you go home. On the third day, there was a marriage in Canaan of Galilee, and the mother of Jesus was there. And both Jesus was called and his disciples to the marriage. And when they wanted wine, the mother of Jesus said unto him, They have no wine. Jesus said unto her, Woman, what have I do to do with thee? Mine hour is not yet come. His mother saith unto the servants, Whatsoever he saith unto you, do it. And there were set the three six water pots of stone after the manner of purifying of the Jews, containing two or three firkins apiece. Jesus saith unto them, Fill the water pots with water. And they filled them up to the brim. And he saith unto them, Draw out now and bear unto the governor of the feast. And they bear it. And when the ruler of the feast has tasted the water that was made wine and knew not whence it was, but the servants which drew the water knew. The governor of the feast called the bridegroom and said unto him, That is, the ruler of the feast saith unto the bridegroom, Every man at the beginning doth for, set forth good wine, and when the men have drunk well drunk, then that which is worse, but thou that hast kept the good wine until now. Gentlemen, this is a as plain as a translator's or different counsels over the scripture. Dare allow it to go to the world, but the thing is there. It is told, Jesus was the bridegroom at the marriage of, the, of Cana in Galilee, and he told them what to do. Now, there was actually a marriage, and if Jesus was not the bridegroom on that occasion, please tell who was. If any man can show this and prove that it was not the Savior of the world, then I will acknowledge I am in error. We say it was Jesus Christ who was married to be brought into the relation whereby he could see his seed before he was crucified. Has he indeed passed by the nature of angels and taken upon himself the seed of Abraham to die without leaving a seed to bear his name on the earth? No, but when the secret is fully out, the seed of the blessed shall get, be gathered in in the last days. For I tell you that it, it is the chosen of God, the seed of the blessed, then shall be gathered. I do not despise to be called the son of Abraham if he had a dozen wives or to be called a brother or a son or a child of the Savior, if he had Mary and Martha and several other wives, as though he did cast seven devils out of one of them, it is all the same to me. Well, then he shall see his seed and who shall declare his generation for he was cut off from the earth. I shall say here that before the Savior died, he looked upon his own natural children. As we look upon ours, he saw his seed and immediately after he was cut off from the earth. But who shall declare his generation? They had no father to hold them in honorable remembrance. They passed into the shades of obscurity, never to be exposed to mortal eye as a seed of the blessed one. For no doubt they had been exposed to the eye of the world. Those infants might have shared the same fate as the children in the days of Herod. 
when all the children were ordained, ordered to be slain under such age, with the hopes of slaying the infant savior, they might have suffered by the hand of the assassin. Assassin, And the sons of many kings have done who were their heirs apparent to the thrones of their fathers. So here again, he makes the, you know, the argument or the presentation that the savior not only was married and was married at that particular wedding, but also um, had uh, plural wives. Now, I've been reading the saints and I just finished volume two, which is from the period of 1846 to 1893. And this period was when they were persecuted for the practice of plural marriage. And then it ends with the manifesto. Now, many left the church at that time, you know, due to that revelation and many men abandoned their plural wives. I now have a little better understanding, not a lot, but some more understanding of why it was in necessary to institute plural marriage during this time. Now, we know Heavenly Father's ways are way above ours. And in this instance, I can see why I can see where many children were needed to be born that would bring about the many blessings that otherwise would not be possible, being us being able to benefit from all of which we have at, at our disposal right now. It is those children that came from that time period that have, you know, allowed uh, for the uh, a stone to keep rolling, you know, across that time. Now, a, a side note here that, you know, that was the time where the first uh, temples that were being built in Utah uh, were being built in the the temple uh, at Salt Lake was uh, about getting ready to be complete. And um, of course, we know that uh, the great blessing that that brought for all the saints at that time. Now, also during that time, it was difficult for a single female to marry because there were few righteous men available. So it makes gives me an understanding why it will be needed in the future. As mentioned earlier about the remnant, there will be a remnant or remnants of his people that will need to replenish the earth. And in the instance in the New Jerusalem, we will have remnants, as we learned earlier, from north, south, east, and west. They're not going to be enough to be able to create the, the generation and the people that we need to fill the earth because many uh, uh, will, will be lost. So in the end, you know, I just want to say that I'm grateful for the knowledge that has been given to us and for the further knowledge that we will continue to receive. And lastly, grace be with all of them that love our Lord Jesus Christ in sincerity. And I say that, amen. Amen. Boy, thought provoking indeed. <laughs> yeah. Who was that um, quote from? Did you say it was President Taylor? Uh, this uh, here was from Orson uh, Hyde. Okay. In George, and uh, General Discourses uh, 2, book, uh, volume 2, um, and it's called Marriage Relations. And there's a lot more that he does discuss in there, but. Um, Yes, those are the two things that are thought-provoking, which are uh, replenishing and what that means, and uh, uh, the Savior being um, married and, and practicing plural marriage. Mm -hmm. Yeah. yeah. Is, sorry, you go ahead, Brittany. Oh, no, that's okay. I was going to say, it's interesting because I, I think about um, you know, like the pyramid of truth. And is that, you know, I think we see the patriarchal order, right? We see that with, um, you know, even in the Book of Mormon, where it talks about you're not allowed to have multiple wives unless the Lord commands it. And I like your tie to, um, you know, that, that practice of patriarchal or celestial marriage and the, um, the Salt Lake temple and the manifesto, because I think it was an example of sacrifice, uh, for the people at that time as well. It was difficult uh, during that time from my understanding that the church was, when it was announced, there was just 
you know, a lot of people were just in tears because they felt like they were going back on, on their religious beliefs and to succumb to what the the government was uh, doing to to the saints and mm -hmm. um, and uh, they had to you know like we said earlier they had to like they had to look at the serpent and um, and um, just do it they didn't understand completely and they had been practicing and they didn't have all of the answers as to well what would they do now that they were a plural wife, what were they supposed to do? And they knew that they upheld the prophet. Now that I think is much more difficult than a vaccine. Mm -hmm. You know, when you're being, you know, persecuted and, you know, your home is being ransacked and, you know, they're, you know, sending your husband to jail because you have, I mean, just, those things, you know, we have no real understanding of what persecution is. Mm -hmm. And so, um, yeah, we, we, we better have our foundation well intact to be able to withstand in the future. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I thought it was really interesting. You know, there, there are some things you talked about that I hadn't considered. It's something that I would absolutely love to have more information on, mm -hmm. you know, because obviously, you know, what he's talking about is, is his speculation. We don't know for sure mm -hmm. that that was actually his wedding, um, but the principles are consistent, right? Like it wouldn't surprise me at all mm -hmm. if Jesus had been married, because just like, um, just like he was saying at the beginning of that, that. Jesus made sure to do all the ordinances, including baptism and, and follow that. So it would not surprise me one bit to learn that he was married to one or multiple wives. Um, children. Yeah, I, it would be interesting. I, I can. That one, I think there may have been a reason for God to, for, for him to not have children just because he was literally like born of, of the father. And so like his body was fundamentally different <laughs> from ours, which made the atonement possible. So I can imagine possibly that, that it would have been, um, wisdom or requisite whatever you know for him to to not have children but but yeah I don't know mm -hmm. um but but I think the point of this what you were saying is that it is thought-provoking that it is a possibility and and all the principles are consistent right like marriage is is a true principle and plural marriage is a true principle mm -hmm. and the every on um, that whole part where he was talking about uh what's the word like what is the word abstinence i guess we're like the the law is, is the law of chastity mm -hmm. right it's not there's no virtue lost in intimate relations between a man and a woman who are married like that is still 100% pure 100% virtuous 100% you know mm -hmm. righteous all of those things so Christ being married and and having an intimate relationship with his wife or wives potentially would not have it, it would not have been a defilement right it, because right. that's not that's not the definition of the law of chastity so right um, yeah i i think what's hard though sometimes is like what is what is considered unrevealed versus, yeah. you know, something that, that we do have revealed because there's also like with greater knowledge, there's greater condemnation, right? So when Moses went up the first time to get the tablets, you know, it was different <laughs> than the tablets that we got. 
And so I wonder a lot of times if, um, you know, some of the sacred truths that maybe are missing from the Bible or, you know, missing from those parts that, you know, we kind of classify as, oh, that's unrevealed. But I think it's one of those, those things where Heavenly Father makes things known in his due time. Mm-hmm. And so what we need to rely on are, you know, what we have at scriptures, what our prophets have said, you know, and then hopefully we don't have to wait very long and we'll see the rest of, you know, the rest of those revelations. Yep. I am so excited for that. There's like, going to be a lot to learn. <laughs> oh, yeah. Like, man, when we get the sealed portion, that's like so exciting to me. Mm-hmm. <laughs> yeah. Okay, so I will go next. So I have John 3, the JST. Then there arose a question between some of John's disciples and the Jews about purifying. And they came unto John and said unto him, Rabbi, he who was with thee beyond Jordan, to whom thou bearest witness, behold, the same baptizeth, and he receiveth of all people who come unto him. John answered and said, A man can receive nothing except it be given him from heaven. Ye yourselves bear me witness that I said I am not the Christ, but that I am sent before him. He who hath the bride is the bridegroom, but the friend of the bridegroom who standeth and heareth him rejoiceth greatly because of the bridegroom's voice. This my joy is fulfilled. Um, So this is going back to that yellow highlighting where it talks about um, the bridegroom and John refers to Jesus as um, being the bridegroom because in a way he calls himself the friend of the bridegroom. So it's kind of like that. It's a little different, but he gets there, Um, you know, and it it also made me think back to that, uh, that miracle about, um, you know, the purifying water, and then it linked back again to the bridegroom. So Helaman 335, nevertheless, they did fast and pray oft and did wax stronger and stronger in their humility and firmer and firmer in the faith of Christ and to the filling of their souls with joy and consolation, yea, even to the purifying and sanctification of their hearts, which sanctification cometh because of their yielding their hearts unto God. And yeah, I just, I tied so many of my thoughts back into that same, that marriage supper and the water being turned to wine Um, and Christ being referred to as the bridegroom. And I added this Helaman 335 because um, it's a good description of what we ask or what we promise to do as part of sacrament prayer. We promise to purify and sanctify our hearts. Um, And we, you know, take Christ's name upon us always. Um, And that's our yielding our hearts unto unto God. And those were my thoughts this week. I love the imagery of the wedding and the bride and the bridegroom. Mm -hmm. And the sacrament. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I think once I made, you know, kind of that connection that it really to me seem to be almost like a symbol or a type of the sacrament. Mm-hmm. Um, I kind of thought, yeah, why wouldn't that be his first miracle? Everything has been about how he's the son of God, how he was sent here to redeem the world that through the atonement, we are made clean. Why wouldn't his first miracle also show that so i'll just end with my testimony that i'm i'm grateful that the lord blesses me even though sometimes i probably don't always do effort in the way that i think i should 
but I'm grateful that he sees that effort. And even though I don't know that meaning, that he still sees that. And I'm grateful for the things that we do have in this church. I'm grateful that, you know, we have the words of the prophets, that we have these sacred documents. We have the revealed book of scripture and the doctrine and covenants that give us all of this information about the ordinances and the covenants. And I'm just really grateful for Heavenly Father that loves us so much that he does reveal all of this to us. In the name of Jesus Christ, amen. Amen. I had one more thought before I move on. Um, just the imagery of the bridegroom coupled with the sacrament, like you were talking about. And I actually have a paper that I wrote a while ago on taking his name upon us and how the the, the two times that that happens just socially in our families and, and things are when we enter a family, usually at birth or by adoption, we take upon us the, the last name of our father. And when a woman is married, she takes upon her the name of the husband. And so, and I think that's beautiful and goes along really well with what you were just talking about, this imagery of Christ being the bridegroom. And as we take the sacrament, we promise to take his name upon us. And it has that like shadow or foreshadowing of a marriage ceremony where you, right? Mm -hmm. Take that name and promise to always remember him, right? And, and to be faithful and, and all of those things. So I, I just wanted to. Yeah, I, I love that. That's That's a great connection. All right, last one. Bring it home. Okay. So my last thought is about the living water. So I'll go ahead and read from John 4. This is um, Jesus talking to the woman at the well. Jesus answered and said unto her, the woman of Samaria, If thou knewest the gift of God and who it is that saith to thee, Give me to drink. Thou wouldest asked of him, and he would have given thee living water. Whosoever drinketh of this water, the physical water in the well, shall thirst again. But whosoever drinketh of the water that I shall give him shall never thirst. But the water that I shall give him shall be in him a well of water springing up into everlasting life. So what is the living water that Jesus spoke of? Elder Bednar explains it really well. He says, the living water referred to in John 4.10 is a representation of the Lord Jesus Christ and his gospel. And as water is necessary to sustain physical life, so the Savior and his doctrines, principles, and ordinances are essential for eternal life. You and I need his living water daily and in ample supply to sustain our ongoing spiritual growth and development. The scriptures contain the words of Christ and are a reservoir of living water to which we have ready access and from which we can drink deeply and long. You and I must look to and come unto Christ, who is the fountain of living waters, by reading, studying, searching, and feasting upon the words of Christ as contained in the holy scriptures. By so doing, we can receive both spiritual direction and protection during our mortal journey. I also looked up the definition of the word living um, and found two definitions for living as an adjective, living water. The first is issuing continually from the earth, running, flowing as a living spring or fountain, as opposed to stagnant. The second definition is producing action, animation, and vigor, quickening, as in a living principle or a living faith. So the living water is Jesus Christ and his gospel. His word itself is living. And if we partake of and act upon his living words, 
we will have spiritual sustenance, the spiritual sustenance we need to obtain eternal life. Doctrine and Covenants 33.1 says, Behold, I say unto you, Open ye your ears and hearken to the voice of the Lord your God, whose word is quick and powerful, sharper than a two-edged sword to the dividing asunder of the joints and marrow, soul and spirit, and is a discerner of the thoughts and intents of the heart. The Doctrine and Covenants Teacher's Manual explains the word quick in Doctrine and Covenants 33.1 does not mean swift, it means living or alive. These words issue forth from Jesus Christ, who is, as Elder Bednar pointed out, the fountain or source of the living waters. Ether 8.26 says, Wherefore I, Moroni, am commanded to write these things, that evil may be done away, and that the time may come that Satan may have no power over the hearts of the children of men, but that they may per be persuaded to do good continually, that they may come unto the fountain of all righteousness and be saved. I thought it was interesting that in Doctrine and Covenants 85, Joseph Smith is also referred to as being or having a fountain or source of truth. So that says, and it shall come to pass that I, the Lord God, will send one mighty and strong, holding the scepter of power in his hand, clothed with light for a covering, whose mouth shall utter words, eternal words, while his bowels shall be a fountain of truth to set in order the house of God. Um, Joseph B. Worthlin in this talk says, Elder Bruce R. McConkie defined living water as the words of eternal life the message of salvation, the truths about God and his kingdom. It is the doctrines of the gospel. He went on to explain, where there are prophets of God, there will be found rivers of living water, wells filled with eternal truths, springs bubbling forth their life-giving droughts that save from spiritual death. The Lord has declared that whether by mine own voice or by the voice of my servants, it is the same. We are blessed to live in a, a day when prophets and apostles live on the earth. Through them, we are refreshed continually by an abundant stream of eternal truth that, if obeyed, brings the living water of the Lord into our lives. And what is the effect of this living water, if obeyed? JST John 1 says, in the beginning was the gospel preached through the Son, and the gospel was the Word, and the Word was with the Son, and the Son was with God, and the Son was of God. For in the beginning was the Word, even the Son, who was made flesh, and sent unto us by the will of the Father. And as many as believe on his name shall receive of his fullness, and of his fullness have we all received, even immortality and eternal life through his grace. For the law was given through Moses, but life and truth came through Jesus Christ. For the law was after a carnal commandment to the administration of death, but the gospel was after the power of an endless life through Jesus Christ, the only begotten Son who was in the bosom of the Father. Doctrine and Covenant 63.23 But unto him that keepeth my commandments will I give the mysteries of my kingdom, and the same shall be in him a well of living water springing up into everlasting life. And last, 1 Corinthians 15, 22, For as in Adam all die, even so in Christ shall all be made alive. And I just loved going through that imagery of, of the living water that it comes from the living God who is the source or the fountain. And then that um, is disseminated through the prophets, right? <laughs> who, who are also um, like secondary sources or fountains and that this living water issues forth from them and we can drink from it. And it's, you know, thirst quenching and, and, you know, abundant and we drink it. And as we drink it, we can then, be alive in Christ and eventually have eternal life. 
Yes, I love this uh, part here where you say, um, uh, the Elder Bednar says that um, you must look at, to and come on to Christ, who is the fountain of living waters, by reading, studying, searching, and feasting upon the words of Christ as contained in the Holy Spirit scriptures. By so doing, we can receive both spiritual direction and protection during our moral journey. Um, we love having the missionaries here in our home, and when they're here, um, they, um, they 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 love to spend a lot of time here. I love for them to be here, but when they go back home or they get transferred, they always come back here and they 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 want to spend some time with us when they leave. And I always have this talk with them about when they when they go back i i um i tell them that the, as missionaries you know they um they've uh, learned to develop some great habits they've learned how to rise up early and and do their scripture study and how they have the they, they've learned how to um uh, have a companion and their they they've learned a lot of life skills and um but I, I, I tell them that there's nothing that's going to prepare you for when you get home to be unplugged from the mothership. Because the mothership, you've been here, you've been under this mantle of, you know, um, all that you do is 24-7 with the Savior, you know. And then when you go home, you get, you know, distracted with life and everything that's going on. And you're going to feel that letdown. And um, these these habits that you form are going to keep you um, through that fountain of the living waters, exactly what we're talking here. And that's how we stay, you know, uh, spiritually directed and protected in, in the continuing journey. And uh, and you've said that earlier about that, you know, that's great that we listen to different people of what they find in the insights, but it doesn't replace your own personal study and your own searching and your own um, time in uh, trying to understand not only the scriptures and what they mean, but more importantly, what they are to you. And so that's part of getting uh, the living waters. You can't get them from someone else. You have to go to the source. Absolutely. I always tie living water back to um, the sacrament as well, because that's our promise. Excellent thoughts, ladies. All right, yes, excellent. Well, um, it was right. great, great uh, seeing you all again this week. We will see you again for the next installation of. And Sisters of Zion covering Come Follow Me for uh, next week. So with that, I'm saying goodbye and uh, good night. Until the next one. <laughs>